Hello everyone and welcome back to Laminati Vintage. Now I know it's been quite a while since my last upload, I've had a lot of stuff to do, there's been a lot of stuff on my mind and there's been quite a few setbacks in terms of producing videos. But now we should be back to uploading a little bit more regularly and I've got some really interesting ideas that should be coming your way pretty soon. So today's video was originally going to be a suit review from Darcy Clothing, but I wanted to give it a little bit more headspace, think about it a bit more, make it the best possible video it can be. That combined with the fact that it's been cold as hell this week. It's been so cold in fact that I've been wearing great coats to work pretty much every day, which was the inspiration for today's video. Today's video, we're going to be taking a look at my collection of great coats. First of all, we're going to be looking at what a great coat is and why I love them so much. And then we're going to be looking at each piece individually. I'm going to tell you a little bit about them and hopefully a little bit of history as well. So first of all, what is a great coat? A great coat is essentially a long, thick woolen overcoat. What separates a great coat from your standard every man's top coat is the length. A great coat usually extends a little bit past the knee, around to mid shin height. And as with many items of clothing, the great coat has quite a rich military history. The great coat was invented to keep soldiers insulated from the cold and to protect them from harsh weather. Now, over history, there have been many different variations and developments in the design, including single-breasted, double-breasted designs, different lengths. Some even had detachable hoods and caped shoulders. For the reasons why I am a lover of grey coats, we'll start off with the material. Now, anyone who knows me personally, or has been watching my channel a lot, or anything like that, will know I am an absolute lover and advocate for the use of wool. Wool is naturally a very insulating material, it's going to keep you very warm and it holds a lot of that insulation property even when it's soaking wet and wool is naturally already quite water resistant and you can treat it with oils and stuff to replicate the natural linen oils that would be produced in sheep. Being a natural material it's very environmentally friendly to source and is completely biodegradable. So where the great coat really excels is in cold, wet, windy conditions. The thickness, the length, and especially in terms of the double-breasted designs, cases it will provide you with excellent protection from the wind and the weather. You can often pull up the collar and fasten it around your neck to keep you even warmer and protect all those important parts of your body that are going to help to keep you nice and warm. And of course you can wear it open when you start moving around and getting a little bit warmer too. So first off we're going to be looking at my Soviet Civil Athlete great coat. Now I have a bit of a soft spot for this coat in particular because it is essentially what started me off my journey going towards vintage clothing. The story behind this coat was I was just fed up of being stood around at school freezing cold in my polyester next parka and me and my friend were starting to show more of an interest in history in the outdoors so I remember I was in a cabin in Devon I think and I thought hey wouldn't it be great if I could have a military greatcoat to keep me warm so I typed in Russian greatcoat into Amazon and the listing came up and 15 year old me was like well shit so as for the material of the coat, it's this lovely, rich navy wool. It's incredibly thick and insulating, probably one of the heaviest weights I own in a great coat. It's lined with cotton on the inside down to about the waist. It's double-breasted in design, which keeps you nice and insulated from the wind. It's fastened with these bright gold metal buttons featuring the insignia of the Soviet Civil Athlete. At the collar of the coat, there is a hook and eye fastening. This is quite common on military great coats. This is to keep it fastened around your neck, to keep you a bit warmer, and also to give you a more cleaner and smarter look when on parade. There are two quite reasonably sized pockets on either side of the hip. And on the back of the coat, we have this singular vent that runs the entire length of the coat. The waist is cinched back with this button on belt. At the very bottom of the coat, on the back, there is this vent that opens up and on one side we have a smaller version of these insignia buttons and no visible buttonholes on the other side. That's not to say you can cut some open and fasten it, but I'm assuming it's just meant to be worn open, there's a bit of extra decoration. So as for pockets, there are two reasonably sized pockets on either hip. And on the inside there's an inner chest pocket which is a perfect size for any small objects especially a phone and you can gain access to this just by popping open one of the buttons slipping your hand in and there it is just in there so what i really like about this great coat is that you can dress it either formal or informal you know the rich navy 
the colour of the wool accented by these gold buttons can give it quite a smart formal appearance but just the thickness and the coarseness of the material can also add to that more rugged approach. You know you could dress this with some workman's trousers, a wool shirt, and a pair of boots and you could go out in the fields or in the forest or you could dress it up a little bit more smarter with a suit and a hat so it is really quite a versatile garment. As for the history behind this coat I haven't been very successful in my searches all I can tell it was used by the Soviet civil athlete. Haven't been able to find any further information or pictures unfortunately. So next up, we have my 1939 pattern British great coat. Now this replaced the 1909 great coat pattern used during the First World War, which was single breasted compared to this thicker, more insulating double breasted design. It was issued to British expeditionary forces in Dunkirk, but was found to have some issues. So it was very quickly replaced by the 1940s pattern which featured a vent that went all the way down the back of the coat for increased mobility. So the material of this coat is this rather finely woven khaki green wool. It's a little bit thinner and a little bit less coarse than some of my other coats, which I think affects insulation a little bit. As stated, it's a double breasted design and it's fastened with these big brassy colored buttons, but the buttons don't carry on the entire length of the coat. You have these six buttons that keep the main section of the coat fastened, but around the chest, they miss out a button on each side. This is because it would mainly be worn with the lapels folded down like so, but if it was getting really cold, you needed to keep it fastened around your body. You can fold the lapels back up and fasten them with two buttons underneath the collar. The collar can actually be pulled up. And there are two missing buttons. I need to find some nice thick buttons to sew on either side. And this is because there is a small piece of wool that can then be buttoned on to keep it closed around your neck. Now if I open this up, this piece of wool is actually supposed to be held inside the coat. So I need to sew in two more buttons here and, it, and it's a little wool patch that would just sit inside there. And I have it stored in the pocket. So there you are, it's just kind of triangular in shape. It would be stored just inside here. And when the collar is worn up around the neck, you just attach it on, button it on like that. And it just keeps it fastened around your neck to keep you nice and warm. On the shoulders, we have epaulets for keeping your webbing all nice and tidy, stop it from slipping down your shoulders. In the back, we have this belt here to cinch in at the waist, and you can obviously adjust it with those three buttons. And actually, two little slits on either side, so if you're not using this belted section, you can just fold it inside the inside of the coat. There's no back vent, which was obviously replaced in the 1940 pattern to increase mobility, but there is like a, there's this little vent opening at the back, which you can button closed. And I'm assuming this is just for added mobility if you're gonna be running around or, you know, anything like that. As for pockets, there are these two quite nicely sized pockets on either hip, but on the inside, there's no inner pocket in the chest which would be pretty handy. So this coat I actually came across in the display of a charity shop. It was a display for Remembrance Day and I saw it and I was like, I want that coat. So for Christmas, my mum inquired into the charity shop and managed to win it in an auction or something like that. And anyway, now it's mine and it just so happened to be a perfect fit. So I wore this coat a lot at college especially during uh, the shooting season because we had a shoot on our college i studied countryside management and gamekeeping and this you know you're doing a lot of standing around especially if you're shooting or if you're beating or whatever it is so this kept me nice and warm on those cold winter windy days so again this is a great item for versatility you could wear this with a thick jumper and heavy boots for going out in the woods you know for a more rugged look or you could go for a kind of rugged formal look. I'd love to wear this over the top of my brown herringbone suit from Darcy Clothing paired with a fedora or trilby on a winter day. It gives you kind of an aura of an edgy detective from the 50s. So next up we have an absolute workhorse of a great coat. This is my standard Russian infantryman's Chanel. This is a very old pattern 
Now, obviously, a long history, the design has been tweaked slightly with just slight cut and measurement differences. But, you know, as far as I can tell, this model, this design of Greatcoat has been in use since before the First World War. During the First World War, the Imperial Russian Army used pretty much exactly the same model. Now, with World War I Russian uniforms, <laughs> materials were all over the place in terms of, you know, the material and the colour, because it was essentially whatever they could get their hands on. The Russian army in the First World War was the biggest army in the world. They had to outfit literally millions of soldiers. So there were massive variations in terms of colour. Some were more grey brown like this. A lot were more kind of khaki greens. You know, you had some even darker browns. It was all over the place. And over history, designs have only really tweaked, like I said, with slight measurement cuts and just the way insignia are displayed. After the Russian Revolution, uh, Red Army was in no financial situation to be able to replace this style of coat. Neither did they need to. In standard Russian form, if it isn't broken, they just didn't fix it, you know? There's still pieces of equipment in the Russian army to this day that bear resemblance or are literally the exact same pattern as things that were being used in the Russian Revolution, in the Second World War. When the Second World War came around, you know, they were still using this, this style of coat. The colors often, from what I've seen, were more kind of browny grays rather than the uh, imperial green colors. And then in the Cold War, they started to become more gray, more of a gray, 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 brown, or kind of a light gray. This is actually the second Chanel I own. The first one I ordered years ago, it's in a much lighter color, and it's a little bit smaller, so I had to order a size up. So the material of the coat is, you know, kind of a medium weight, but very, very coarse, hairy wool which makes it probably one of the warmest coats I have. And it's also got a secret ingredient, which is the finest quality Soviet asbestos. And that's not a joke. I was talking to someone in a Soviet uniforms group on Facebook, I think it was, and he said that a friend and him, just for fun, decided to run some asbestos tests on some bits of Soviet era equipment. And, you know, things like webbing belts and great coats were all testing positive for asbestos. So maybe that gives an extra insulation. So something very unique about Russian grey coats in particular, you've probably noticed it's a very simplistic, clean design here. There are no buttons, no functioning buttons on the coat. There are a couple in this back vent here at the bottom, you know, like we've seen on the other coats. They're really just for display. And through history, you might see a standard infantryman's Russian grey coat with buttons down the front. Uh, in the First World War, there were a few examples, I believe, and especially in the Cold War, I'm not sure exactly when, but they started issuing great coats with just the standard gold buttons down the front emblazoned with the, with the hammer and sickle. My first great coat I bought, the Chanel, actually did have that on the front and I have the button still, but these hold no purpose except decoration. The way this coat is fastened is with these hook and eyes, this hook and eye fastening here, like so, they just fasten up. So there are a couple reasons for this. Now, first of all, is they notice that bright colored metal buttons glint and give you away. So by removing the buttons completely, it's gonna keep, help to keep you a lot, a lot more hidden from the enemy. And another reason for this is you can crawl across the forest floor, you can brush up against things, and you're not gonna be losing buttons all over the place. As for the pockets on this coat, I, I love the way it does the pockets because we have these big, deep slash pockets. You can store a lot of stuff in these pockets, but they're also built for practicality of being able to stick your hands in. You know, Russia being a very cold place, they know how to do cold weather clothing. They understand that you need to keep your hands warm in order for them to function. So they've designed them perfectly so your hand can fit very comfortably and just sit in there warm them up nicely. On the inside of the coat we have a chest pocket the same as our other Soviet pocket and it's very easy to get into you just undo one of those hook and eyes slip your hand in and there you are you have instant access to your pockets. On the back we have a single vent that runs the entire length of the coat and we have this separation at the bottom here. Now Again, we don't have any holes on the other side, but it wouldn't take a lot just to cut them open. Then you can fasten it together or open it up. And we have this 
on the on the back we have these two hooks. I don't know if it's a hook and eye, I would imagine it would just connect like that. So I'm not entirely sure what these two hooks here are for. If anyone knows, leave a comment. There's probably some people out there who know a lot more than me. And here we have this single belt which cinches in the waist, attached by these hammer and sickle emblazoned buttons. I wore this coat a lot, a lot, a lot through college, you know, when I was out working in the woods and you know, just doing dirtier, rougher work. It's warm, it's insulating, it's got a very rugged look to it. So it doesn't matter if you get it a bit dirty, it just adds to the character. So this was just my working winter coat during college. Because it's such a rugged and simplistic design, it is a little bit harder to kind of dress up formally. So it's, I usually just tend to stick to, you know, work clothes and jumpers and boots wearing this coat. So something interesting about this coat it is exactly the same model that was worn by Stalin a lot of the time. You know, for a long time, Stalin wore just a standard infantryman's Chanel up until it got a little bit worn out. And there's a story that goes along with this. Stalin was out somewhere, I think, and I think a friend of his saw the coat and decided to get him made a new fancy formal double-breasted one. And when Stalin came home, he saw the new coat hanging up and he's, his first words were, where is my old coat? And when they told him that they'd thrown it out, he got pretty pissed. And he said something to the effect of, with the public's money, he could buy a new coat every week, but he could have just as easily worn that old coat for a whole other year before it needed to be replaced. <laughs> Oh, dust is starting to suck my allergies. <sighs> so next up is my Bulgarian Army Infantryman's Great Coat. Now, very similar to the Chanel, it's made from this rather dark grey wool. It's it's pretty coarse, but it's a little bit thinner than the Chanel. So it's not quite as warm. Now, very similar to the Chanel, it's got hook and eyes running down the side. There's only two of them though. It's also paired with these functioning buttons. This coat wasn't actually originally mine. This belonged to my one of my best friends who I dressed a lot and collected uh, vintage military surplus with. You know, we, we were some of the most stylish people in school, I can assure you. On the shoulders, it features these epaulets, which are, which are lined with this uh, bright red piping and these insignia kind of tabs on the collar, which also have the insignia of two crossed rifles and a crest, which I think along with the red piping signals an infantryman, just a standard infantryman. In typical greatcoat fashion, it's lined with cotton down to the waist. Moving on to the back, there is no back pleat. There's no back vent. There is a small waist belt at the back to cinch in the waist. And down here we have an opening, but there's no buttons no buttonholes, no way of fastening that closed. It's a very rugged, crude piece of Soviet gear that's been made to look a bit prettier with this piping and these buttons. So one thing I do really like about this coat is you've got these big turn back cuffs on the sleeves, which I, I quite like. It gives a bit of something extra. So the last full wool great coat I have in my collection is this. This is my British Army Foot Guards great coat so the royal guards you see outside buckingham palace are usually in red well in winter they switch over to this their winter uniform this is very much a display piece i wouldn't really wear this out not because i disagree with wearing surplus like this out i'm absolutely fine with that just it's very difficult to style because it's quite a specific style you know it's very ornamental uh it's this bluey steely gray wool it's very fine very good quality material. These big golden shiny buttons emblazoned with some insignia, I'm not exactly sure which. It's got these small epaulets on the shoulder, this turn back cuff on the sleeves, which is rather nice. There's a Velcro patch underneath here, keeping this, keeping this collar together. On the back, we have this beautiful pleating. There's a, there's a middle vent and there's two side vents. And then we have this small belt at the back here and the pleating continues here. We have one, two, three, continuation at the top here. These vents here, there's no, there's no separation there. There's no buttons, it's just all one piece. But it looks very, very nice from the back. So now for a few kind of honorable mentions. These aren't technically great coats. 
because they're not specifically made from a woven wool material, but they are longer style coats that I thought would be worth mentioning. So first up, we have one of the prides of my collection. This is my Bekesha. Uh, Bekesha has a long running history in the Russian army. I've been told that soldiers were soldiers and officers were wearing something similar in the First World War. I haven't personally seen any pictures of that, but that's what I've read. I believe the design and the cut was kind of more standardized and a pattern was made during the Second World War. If anyone knows anything more, you know, feel free to comment and correct me. But these were often issued to officers during the Second World War, while the standard infantry would be wearing a Chanel. They were also issued to standard soldiers who were operating in colder regions, such as Gulag prison guards, I believe, wore these, as well as tank crewmen. In the Cold War, I believe they were issued more freely to anyone who needed them, you know, people operating in mountainous areas or just really cold areas. Now, it's essentially a slightly shorter cut great coat made entirely of sheepskin. On the outside, you have this nice suede material that can be waterproofed. On the inside, you have just full, untrimmed, you know, proper fluffy warm sheep skins this is made of multiple sheep obviously you can see the different hairs different colors of all the different squares that have been cut out to make the coat it's very heavy of course and extremely warm i've seen pictures of soldiers having the cuffs just left like that folded over keeps the hands a little bit warmer extends over the wrists and i've seen soldiers who turn back the cuffs and just have a bit of the hair just out like that and you know freeze up your hand a little bit more now this collar here is very big very very tall very big collar for a great coat or a, you know a longer style coat and here obviously this buttons up we have two flaps here that extend over each side so you can wear it tight up around your neck and this extends quite far up the face and it's going to keep you really really warm and you know like proper Siberian blizzard. The coat fastens up at the front to the one side with these plastic buttons and the leather toggles on the other side like this. There are two pockets, you know, kind of fairly large sized pockets at each hip. There's no inner pocket, unfortunately, but on the back, there's no pleating, there's no venting. It's just straight cut. There's no, there's no back belt to cinch in the waist. This particular example, I believe, is a size 50. Now I believe my Russian size is a 46 dash two or three or four, something like that. So this is a little bit big for me, but I've looked and I've looked and I've looked, but I've never found a Bekesha in a size 46. Well, I'll keep my eyes out. So obviously it's very rare that I get to wear this. The conditions, the temperature never really gets cold enough in England. Maybe if I'm just sat outside, you know, sat down for a while on a particularly cold and windy day, I might just chuck this on and I know that I'll never get cold. I did take this to Northern Norway with me when I went, but even there, even there, I still got, you know, too warm with it because it's just so warm and insulating and protective. But it's great to just, you know, play around with the snow. Keeps you nice and keeps you nice and dry and warm. So the last thing I'm going to show you today is my caped wax duster. It is a modern coat and it is uh, nothing expensive, but it's based on a very traditional design. You know, it was very prevalent in the West, especially among cowboys and just people who just needed a, just a loose outer jacket that they could wear when riding, keep all their other clothes you know, nice and clean. And it's essentially what I use it for now, you know? It needs a waxing every now and again to keep it waterproof. But it's just, a, it's just a work coat, you know, I batter it out, I get it dirty, chuck it on to protect all my other clothes, it covers my whole body. I've got two nice sized pockets each hip, one on the inside, you've got these nice caped shoulders here, and then you've got big vent on the back <laughs> if you want to ride a horse. It's got all the bells and whistles, and it's just a, it's just a great, great outer layer coat for keeping me nice and dry protects against the wind, just keeps all my other clothes nice and clean. Now, even though it is a particularly rugged and, you know, kind of worky styled coat, it is still something that I would wear 
with the soup, you know, if it was raining quite heavily, chuck this over the top, protects my soup, keeps me dry and warm, does everything I need it to really. So the last thing I'm going to talk about today is kiltability, which is something we're probably going to be doing a lot of on this channel now when we review products. We're going to be talking about if you can wear it well with a kilt. Now, a kilt being a traditional piece of clothing, as with any traditional piece of clothing, there are some people who think you should not divert from tradition at all, you should only wear certain items with it, but most people, when kilts are involved, are completely fine for you to do what you want with it. You know, it's really personal taste, you know, within the bounds of good taste, of course. So I have no problem with it. I personally also wear great coats, long coats, you know, wax dusters. If I'm wearing a kilt and it's a particularly wet and windy day, you know, you want the freedom of movement and you like the feel and the look of a kilt, but obviously it's raining heavily and it's windy and you just want something to give you a bit more protection. And I personally think it gives you quite an interesting silhouette. So that's my thoughts on the matter. That is about it for today's video guys. I really hope you enjoyed it, maybe even learned something from it. If you did, leave a like, comment, you know, subscribe, whatever you want. And yeah, I would really be interested to get some feedback on how people liked this style of video. Anyway, really be interested to get some feedback on what people thought of this style of snowing. Anyway, really be interested in them getting some feedback on what people thought of this style of video where I get a load of stuff and just talk through it, you know, collections of things. I have plenty of stuff like that, mess kits, backpacks, wool shirts, trousers, you know, work shirts, all kinds of things like that. I can give you my opinion on it. And obviously we will be doing our reviews on products from different companies and just, you know, traditional clothing. I have lots of different avenues I want to go down. So just leave a comment. Let me know what kind of content you'd like to see in the future and I'll do my best to take on board. Another thing is I recently got into a relationship and she is very, very eager to start dressing vintage and look at historical clothing and bushcraft. So she's also really interested in coming on video with me and helping me out, maybe branching into some women's wear, you know, that kind of thing. So let me know what you think of that. And I'm pretty sure you'll be seeing her in the near future, hopefully. Also, thank you to everyone who's been really supportive to me on all my platforms, YouTube and on Instagram. If you want to follow my Instagram, because I'm pretty active on there and you'll see a lot more stuff on there as well. You'll be able to get to contact me if you want. I'll get my guy to leave my name up somewhere on the screen. Uh, thank you to everyone who's been very supportive. I've talked to a lot of companies. I've talked to a lot of people. I've got a lot of plans. So please stay tuned and I'm sure we're going to have some very interesting content coming out as soon as I can get out. I've offered on for quite an hour, quite a while now and yeah. Cheers. Mutta vieläkin syömässä soinnattaa, kun soittajan sormista kuulassa. Säkkijärven polkka.